accept you. And make it your life's goal to pray to God that he will squeeze out of you everything he put in you for his glory. His glory to love, serve, and obey him in all that you do. That, that should be your aim as you look at you. So who am I? I'm the top of the apex of the pinnacle of God's creation. Why am I here? To love and serve and obey my creator, Jesus Christ. Now, next question, what's wrong with the world? Let's see what the text says about that. Continuing on now in uh, uh, verse 21. So what's wrong with the world? And you, who were once alienated, Hostile in mind, really evil. Man. So, what's wrong with the world? You and me and all of us that this verse is talking to. See, you were created to serve, love, honor, and obey Jesus Christ, yet you don't. I don't. You live selfishly. You learn to live to serve yourself, to satisfy your own desires, and you don't obey, serve, and love Him. You see, the text says that you are alienated. What does that mean? That means separated. That means far apart. That means not together. Separated from God. You were hostile. You were evil in your mind. You thought horrible, violent thoughts towards God. You're doing evil, dirty, horrible, terrible things. Now I know what you're thinking. Because I thought it too. I'm not that bad. I don't, I don't cheat. I don't, I don't steal. I, I, I rarely lie. I'm definitely going to kill them. I'm not that bad. That's not me. I'm not that person. Well, once again, let's, let's see what the text says about that. Because I, I felt that same way at one point. I'm not that bad. Once again, if you got your Bible, let's open them up to Romans uh, chapter 3, starting with verse 10. This is what it says to those of us who think we're not that bad. It says, None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Skipping on down. For all have sinned and fall short. See, the standard is not how you're compared to other people around you. You don't set the standard. I don't set the standard. God sets the standard. You know who the standard is? Whether you're right or not? It's Jesus Christ. The perfect, sinless, spotless Jesus Christ. And Jesus said that the sum of the whole law and obeying God is summed up in this. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Second, love others as yourself. Has anyone in this room ever even had one moment in your life where you loved God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and you loved others as yourself? Even one moment. Think about it. I bet you to say no to the ones with ourselves. No, I don't. I haven't. But Jesus did. Think about it. There was never one moment in his life where he didn't love the Lord God with all his heart, mind, and soul. That's the same. You see, as when he sets the standard, it's either all or nothing. It's like a high jump. You, you don't jump to the bar and you just miss the bar by a little bit, that you still get points. No, you either make it or you miss it. See, what makes this even more scary is that God is so good that he can't even be around sin. As we mentioned, we were separated. We're far apart. You are separated from God. Far apart from God. Not even on the same planet. And nothing you can do can take you one step closer to God. You realize that there are things that you thought, said, and did yesterday that God should have killed you in your sleep for? And me too. There are things you have done in your life and done in my life that calls into question the very justice of God for not destroying me on the spot. Yet in His mercy, He did not. So what's wrong with the world? What's wrong with the world is that the whole earth groans for our destruction and 
punishment for our disobedience to God. That's what's wrong. And I know if you're like me, you're thinking right now, I really need the answer to the question. If I am what's wrong, how can what's wrong be made right? Continuing on in uh, Colossians 1.22. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. This is the good news. See, the good news is that you were separated. You, you were thinking evil thoughts about God. You were uh, doing evil, terrible, horrible deeds. Yet, he has now reconciled, brought you back together, and now you are holy and blameless and above reproach before him. That's the good news. This is what you need in life and all you need. We tend to say it's a catch well, I need something. You know, we say, we say, uh, you know, Mom, you know, I need new clothes. Dad, I really need this new car. Man, I need to win this game. But this is all you need. This is the thing. This is the gospel of what God has done for you. So let's break this down. So he has now. He did this. God did this. Not you, not me, not anybody up here, but God did this. You didn't do anything that brought this about. God did. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift from God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. There's no bragging in this. There's nothing special in you or me that chose God over someone else and they didn't do it. God did. This is the work of God. Not you. You didn't, you didn't earn this. You didn't work for this. Titus 3, 5 says, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, God did this. Well, what did he do? He go on the text. He reconciled. Reconciled. What does that word mean? That's the word. What it means to be reconciled is the concept of once again, you're separated, you're alienated, you're far apart. It's like two friends that get in a fight, right? And they're fighting it out, they're screaming at each other, they're hitting each other. They can't, they gotta be separated. They can't even be in the same room without screaming at each other and fighting. Well, eventually they calm down and they come back together. They hug it out. They're friends again. They're now reconciled back into, brought into fellowship, friendship, harmony again. Okay? That's the concept of being reconciled. Remember, don't be confused with the analogy of friends calming down. You didn't do this. Who did? Keep going to the text. It says, reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Remember, he we're talking about here is Jesus. His body of flesh by his death. Jesus died to reconcile. Well, why did he have to die? Well, he had to die because he had to be punished. God had to punish him. Why? Well, because God really had to punish us. Remember how we talked about a minute ago that you can't be in the presence, that God can't even be in the presence of sin because he's so good? He has to punish sin. Why does he have to punish sin? Well, he has to punish sin because in God's word, he says that he's just. The concept of being just is like a judge, okay? If somebody goes before a judge, right, and that judge says you are guilty, you did this, you, you stole, you murdered, you whatever, you're guilty. If that judge was to say, you're guilty, but I'm just going to let you go. You can walk. Don't worry about it. Is that a good judge? No. He is not just if he does that. He must punish that sin by law. He has to do it. That judge has to do that. Okay? That's what God is. God is just. He must punish our sin. But it says he doesn't punish us for our disobedience, for our sin, for our selfishness. Who does he punish? In his body, he punishes Jesus. You see, Jesus was perfect, but we weren't. So he went up on that cross, and when he was nailed up there, he took all of our sins, all our disobedience, all our selfishness, everything that is against God, he took it on himself. And God poured out his wrath and punishment and righteous anger on Jesus instead of us, in our place, as a substitute, on our behalf. So we weren't up there. He was being punished to the point of death in his body of flesh. That's how he reconciled. Now why 
Why do it? Why do you do that to us? You know, it says that in order to present you cold and blame and a proper approach for him. You see, when, when he took on your sin, and he was punished for your sin, guess what he gave you? He gave you something way better. He gave you his righteousness, his perfection, his sinlessness. Remember how we talked about that he was perfect and he loved God with all his heart, mind, and soul every moment of his being? He gave that to you. So now you can stand before God, not, not covered in what you do, not surrounded by what you have done, but by what he has done. And wrap yourself in his perfection, sinlessness, perfectness of Jesus Christ. And you can stand before God now and be in his presence eternally and not be separated. And now you have sinlessness. The obedience of Christ. So who am I? Who are you? The top apex, the pinnacle of creation of God. Why are you here? You're here to love, serve, and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all the world. I am you are. We're here to love, serve, and obey Jesus Christ, but we don't do it for ourselves and ourselves. How can we all be made right? Only, only through the work of Jesus Christ. He did by taking on your disobedience, being punished for getting you his righteousness through his life, death, and resurrection. <laughs> yes, I said resurrection. See, the story doesn't end here. It doesn't end right there. You see, Jesus, when he died, was up under punishment. He rose again three days later. He rose again from the grave, defeating death, hell, sin, and the grave, um, stating that his work was complete. It was finished on your behalf, signaling that, that the Father's wrath that was due to you was satisfied. Not only that, he ascended back up to God, back up to the Father. He's seated at the right hand, waiting to come back again. He is coming back. Revelation 19 says that uh, one day, heavens will be opened and Jesus will come back. And when he comes back, he's going to have flame from his eyes, and many crowns on his head, a sword from his mouth. And he's coming back to judge the living and the dead and to bring his children home with him to eternal life with God and those who are not his children to eternal punishment and destruction in the lake of fire. That is how what's wrong can be made right. Only through the work of Jesus Christ then and in the future. Only through him. So if you came in this morning and you didn't know who you were, you were questioned. You leave no that you were the top apex, the pinnacle of the creation of God. If you came in not knowing why are you here, you leave knowing that you exist and love, serve, and obey Jesus Christ. If you came in wondering what's wrong with the world and you wanted to point out there and say it's this government or that government or this person, that person, that thought process, that ideology, something else, you leave knowing that what's wrong with the world is you leave knowing that you are disobedient and sinful and evil to the core. And you know that what's wrong with the world is we are all in the same boat. You also leave knowing that there's a way that what's wrong can be made right. And that's only through one name, one name alone, that name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Him is what's wrong with you. If you came in 